Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof? Martin. Walter. How are you doing? No, I'm doing well, and you? <laughs> Good. We're going to talk about Mahanaim. Now, why would you want to talk about that? I don't know. We'll have to look and see. <laughs> <laughs> so get, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for all these blessings and all the things that you do for us. And we ask now your enlightenment with the Holy Spirit. And guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. We spoke in the last one about uh, pendulum swing and where we're heading in the stream of time. And it seems to me that the final confrontation is coming closer mm -hmm. and closer. And so what is it that we need to be aware of when we come to this final confrontation, because a final confrontation like that can create many emotions. Yeah. You can have fear mm -hmm. and think, what am I going to do in a case like this? You're realizing that the end is coming near and you ask yourself, am I ready? That's it. All of these emotions go through your head. Most of your emotions actually begins with fear. Yeah. Because if you have fear, and you can't get it under control. Then you can have anger, depression. You have all these other things. That actually, that's why the Bible actually, Jesus tells us, don't fear. Don't be afraid. So we, we titled this one Mahanaim. And we'll see in a moment why. Mm. So it is actually a little study on how to deal with the time that we're living in how to deal with the coming confrontation, and also how to be prepared for the coming confrontation, and also who will be involved yes. in the coming confrontation. Yeah. All right, so let's see where we're going. Let's start with Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. I mean, this is a, a key word, a key verse mm -hmm. when it comes to any of the events that will take place. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's a very loaded verse. If we read there in uh, Spiritual Gifts, it says, The woman is a symbol of the church, and the remnant of the church represents Christians of the last generation of men living just prior to the second advent. The dragon makes war on these for keeping the commandments of God, Sabbath and all, and having the testimony of Jesus Christ, which according to the inspired definition of chapter 19, verse 10, is the spirit of prophecy. Here then are the causes of the dragon's warfare upon the remnant. They teach the observance of the Ten Commandments and the revival of the gifts and acknowledge the gift of prophecy amongst them. This creates ire. He is angry. Yeah. And he makes war. When the devil got one foot upon the fourth commandment and the other upon the gifts planted in the Christian church by Jesus Christ, then his satanic majesty was filled with revengeful delight. But when the remnant, whom God designs to fit for translation to heaven without seeing death, ask for the old paths, where is the good way and walk therein, then the dragon is wrath and makes war with them. Martin, he's got the whole world under his control. Mm -hmm. He's got them towing the line, keeping false precepts that come out of the dictates of men. And now all of a sudden people say, where are the ancient paths and start walking in them. That could upset his apple cart, right? I'm sure it is. It's doing it already. All right. So that's the basis of the warfare and uh, how we're going to deal with it. Let's continue. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. Of all the blessings which God has bestowed upon his people, the gift of his Son accepted, none have been so sacred and so important to their welfare as the gift of the holy, his holy law and his Holy Spirit. 
the gift of God's Son is incalculable. Mm. It is incomputable. It will be the study of all eternity, right? But the hedge that he has put mm. in mm. and the mechanism whereby we can know which way to go is the law and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing what you just said. Because a lot of people say, oh, but the law is a burden. It's a yoke. No. Yeah. It's, it's light. And it's a hedge. It's a hedge to protect, to protect you. Protect you. So those two, without them, you will not get to your final goal because the Holy Spirit has to convict you. But he will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, right? He brings you back to the law. And if you, if you take the law out, then you don't have a definition of sin and you don't have a definition of righteousness. Yeah. Then you can make up your own story. And Correct. And Jesus was the law embodied. Mm. None have been so well calculated to thwart the plans of Satan and consequently to stir his rage as these. And when that people should arise in the last generation of men who should be observing all ten of the precepts of God's holy law and should recognize the revival of the spirit of prophecy, they might expect to feel that bitterness from their opponents, which can arise only from the direct inspiration of Satan. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, once that fullness sinks in and you accept that verse, then you are in a war. That's it. Automatically. You cannot accept God in your life and have it easy. The testimony of Jesus, said the angel to John, is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19.10. It is the keeping of the commandments of God and the recognition of the revival of the spirit of prophecy by the remnant of the church or the Christians of the last generation that stirs the ire of the dragon. Martin, that's one of the reasons why we have never tried to hide it under a bushel. We put it up front, and it creates a stir. That's it. But uh, if the stir is positive, then people will understand what the value is that has been added. So that is a very important point that we need to ponder. So let's sum this up. Those within the church that do not hold to the testimony or that marginalize it, cannot thus by definition be part of the remnant. Is Do, that too harsh a thing to say, Martin? Uh, we've been saying it all along. All right. Don't call yourself part of the remnant if you don't qualify for the qualifications needed by the Bible to be part of the remnant. Some in the remnant say, all right, we keep the commandments, no, 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 no. but the There's other two. one we won't have. There are two legs, Two legs. Right? Two legs. Because the remnant must have both attributes. There are thus members and leaders in the church that are not part of the remnant, but part of the tares. Mm. And unfortunately, the Bible tells us that the wheat and the tares grows together. Mm. So those tares are going to remain in the church until the harvest. Mm. And we we'll often ask ourselves, Lord, why do you allow the tares in the church? They, they are such a problem. Well, sometimes it seems that they are the majority as well. <laughs> well, they are the majority. Mm. There are more tares than there are uh, true believers in both legs. Mm -hmm. But Martin, when the storm comes, when the wind comes, what happens to tares? Blows away. They just blow away. So I, I feel we are heading for a storm. There is a wind coming, a whirlwind as a matter of fact. Mm. And how are you going to stand in these last days? Because the confrontations will not only come from without, they will also come from within. Actually more from within. And the tears will be very, very active. In fact, very often we have come across 
uh, tremendous opposition, largely because of the second leg, the spirit of yes. prophecy. Yeah. So, Martin, why have we called this Mahanaim? I don't even know if we pronounce that correctly, but whatever. That's what it says there. Well, we find it in the Bible, and if you look it up in the concordance, what does it mean? Mahanaim, Yim, so something like that. It's a double camp, a place in Palestine, Mahanaim. It occurs 13 times in the King James Version, and it means two hosts. So the Lord's host and Jacob's host is one of the examples. And we do not have to face the enemy alone because there are two hosts. Ma, Machanaim, something like that, Martin, whatever. Just say it, Mahanaim. Mahanaim. Okay. So we have to look up and see in which way does this comfort us, in which way does this admonish us, and in which way does it give us some surety that we do not have to face this enemy alone. Alone, exactly. Well, like you said, it gives us some self-assurance and some peace to know you're not battling this alone. You're not alone. So let's just look at this story and get the context. Genesis chapter 32. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Now that's plural, Martin. Angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Two hosts. Two hosts. Mm. So there was his host, the people that were with him, and then there was God's host. And Jacob sent messages before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So he was on his way to meet his brother, and he realized it was going to be a very dangerous operation because Esau had promised to kill him. Yeah, yes. Now, Esau was his brother. That makes you think, doesn't it? It does. They are related. Yes. So, in a church format, it can be they are from the same faith, probably. It could be. But the one tried to do what the Lord wanted him yes. to do. He made mistakes, mm -hmm. big mistakes, but he tried to do what the Lord wanted him to do. And uh, he felt sorrow for his sin. But the other one was a religion of compromise. And just the very ones that he surrounded himself with, Esau, he took his wives, not from the children of Israel. He took his wives outside of that milieu. And uh, the mindset of Esau, the Bible says, God hated. Yeah. It says Esau he hated, but God doesn't hate anyone. He wants to save everyone. And we can see at the end of time that even the Edomites, many of them will be saved. Mm -hmm. So it's not about that, it's about the mindset. Yes, that's what he ate. It's the same with Cain. So what was the mindset of Esau? Wasn't it a mindset of compromise, mm -hmm. of mingling? Yeah. Uh, wasn't it an ecumenical mindset, basically? It was. It was about rebelling as well. Yes. Genesis 32, verse 4, And he commanded them, saying, Thus shalt you speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob says thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now, and I have oxen and asses and flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I may find, find grace in his sight. So he's very courteous, but he's very apprehensive. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. These were probably armed to the teeth, right? Yeah, that's actually an army. All right, so way. here is a clash of armies. 
But it's interesting that Jacob knew that he was not alone. There were two troops, Ma'anaim. He wasn't going to be able in his strength to overcome Esau. No. No. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands. And he said, if Esau came to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So even here there were two bands. Within, within Jacob there were two bands. Yeah, he probably did not... Uh, he also distinguished which ones to put at a certain place. Yes. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. So was he doing this under a specific command of God? Yes. Yes. Mm. Therefore, he could have relied on the responsibility that was also God's responsibility. That's it. When God promises something or gives you something to do, then there's obviously you can rely on him supplying you the means to do it. All right. Now, how does that apply to us when we have to go and face this enemy in the time that we are living in? And he, he acknowledges that he's not worthy. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become too bad. So even within God's people, there are divisions. Yeah. As we face the enemy, there are divisions. And we are going to have divisions in our ranks. And some will actually turn against God's people. Yes, and join the other side. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he's rehearsing his experience with God. Yeah, and the promises. And he lodged there that same night and took of that which came to his hand to present for Esau his brother. Two hundred she-goats, twenty he-goats, two hundred ewes, twenty rams, thirty milk. Camels, interesting, it's like the old English milk, German milk. Camels with their colt, 40 kine, 10 bulls, 20 she-asses, 10 foals. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves and set them unto his servants. Pass over before me and put a space betwixt drove and drove. So he's doing everything in his power to show that he is not an enemy, but that he has the well-being of his brother at heart. Hmm? That's it. So when we bring the gospel, is it to only slam or is it for the well-being and to convert? So important. Always, it must be that you want to evangelize. You want to help. Okay. Whenever you do anything. And he commanded the foremost, saying, When Esau my brother meeteth thee and asketh thee, saying, Whose art thou? And whither goest thou? And whose are these before thee? Then shalt thou say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau, and behold, also he is behind us. And so commanded he the second and the third, and all that followed the drove, saying, In this manner shall you speak unto Esau when ye find him. And say ye, Moreover, behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us, for he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he will accept me. So went the present over before him and himself lodged that night in the company. He did everything possible to show that he was not malicious and that he had good intentions. Yeah. And we must do the same, right? But then comes the night of wrestling because he knows that this enemy will kill him if God does not intervene. Yeah. 
he cannot with his host face it alone. No. And we're going to have the same experience. We're going to face this host that is hostile, thinking that we are on a war path with them, when actually, actual fact, our motive is to win them over to God's cause. And they perceive the motive as one of hate speech and aggression. Yes, they think we are attacking. In the mean, and if you are, you must change how you feel about it. Because it has to be, like you said, to win them over. It must be of love, of help. And then he goes through what is called the night of Jacob's trouble. And that is something that uh, we will have to go through. It's prophesied that God's people will go through a night of Jacob's trouble, wrestling with yourself. Because if you are not right with God, how are you going to face the enemy? And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Yabok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. So Martin, this is not something you can do in a group. This is a personal issue. Something between you and God. Mm -hmm. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, this is now Jesus wrestling with Jacob. God himself, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint and he wrestled with him. Now he was even incapacitated to a, a sense, in a sense, right? So he realized that he had no defense. His entire defense was God now. That's it. Ma'anaim. That's it. He relies now on the other troop. He's actually just a... A vessel now. Yes. Def relying on the... And he's limping. Yeah. Do you think we're limping, Martin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're so bashed. We're not only the hip is out Creeping. of joint. Everything's out of joint. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. That must be our battle cry. I will not let thee go. Do you think the devil is throwing the book at us to make us let go? Oh, yes. Every, to make us lose confidence in God? Every trick you can throw at us, he's trying. Surely you haven't come across this, have you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely have. Yeah. Okay, and he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Uh, we will all, if we are faithful, receive a name change, right? Mm -hmm. A new name. A new name. And it says, There has power with God. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. Mm -hmm. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him then. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So he didn't actually get the name. He had to be satisfied with the knowledge that God cares. That's it. He had to have faith. Yes. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him and he halted upon his thigh. So Martin, we're going to halt on our thigh as we face the anti-typical Esau. Mm -hmm. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and the sinew that shrank. So, Martin, if we jump to the New Testament and we absorb the issues of the story, the night of wrestling, he would not let go. He was a sinful man, Jacob. Mm. He had deceived in the way in which he got the birthright. Yeah. Initially, he 
he bought the birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. Yeah. But then, to make sure that he really got it, he deceived. Yes. And that was a sin. And he repented of that sin. And God forgave him. So if we jump to the New Testament and we read in Romans what our situation will be, we see, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Mahanoim. There are two troops. We must never lose sight of the fact that there are two, two troops. troops. Well, it also lets me think of that situation where the prophet asked Gazi's eyes to be opened by, the, by God, and he could see the host. Yes, and he saw the host, and it said, the chariots of fire, they were all around. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, rather, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep to the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him, that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This should be our comfort. Yeah. This is what you go to war with. And no matter how bleak it looks, no matter how much tribulation there is, how much distress, how much persecution, how much famine, nakedness, peril, sword, no matter what he throws at you, this is your comfort. That's it. God has a host and he's there. He's there. Mahanaim. There are two hosts. So let's unpack this a little bit. Let us love God supremely, allowing no influence to come between us and our God. We must give heed to the light which God has permitted to shine upon our pathway. We must show before all heaven that we appreciate every ray of light. We must reflect that light upon others. That's important, right? It's not a self-centered love. No, we don't have a self-centered religion. But we must also appreciate the light that God has given. How do you show that you appreciate light that God has given. When you share it. And when you yes. act upon it. Yes, when it shines. And you so you share it and you act upon it. Yeah. You can't share light that you don't live yourself. Exactly. If you don't, let's take it in a practical. If you don't read your Bible, you cannot not have the light to shine. That's right. And if you don't apply it to your life, you're a hypocrite. We are responsible to God for our influence. Even if we are compelled to stand apparently alone, we are not alone. For Christ is with us to encourage and strengthen and bless us. He is acquainted with every desire of your heart, with every purpose of your soul. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. John 14, 18. Let us believe that God will do just as he has promised. We must not allow our minds to drift and come to no point. We know that the Lord is soon to come and we must serve God from principle and be firm as a rock to follow in the path of obedience because it is, it is the only safe path. All right, so is there something that we have to do? Yes, we have to be obedient. And we have to live up to the light that we have. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, then we must also share it. Yes. Will that inspire the wrath of the, of the dragon? We have a promise that it would, yes. Okay. So we're looking at how to deal with, with the last mm. conflict. And we must have this word, ma'anaim, in, in our mind. We're not alone. We're not alone, even if it looks as if we are alone, even if we're limping. 
How are we going to do this? How are we going to fight a, a nimble <laughs> enemy if I'm limping on one hip? His servants are as dear to him as the apple of the eye. In trial, in want, in perplexity, in distress, we are not alone. At every step, in tones of assurance, he bids us follow me. I will never leave nor forsake thee, but this blessed assurance is given only on condition of our obedience and faithfulness to him. People don't like those words. They want to make it legalistic, if you say, if you call obedience. They like the first part, yeah, but they don't like the second mm -hmm. part. To Peter, the words, follow me, were full of instruction. Not only for his death, but for every step of his life was the lesson given. Hitherto, Peter had been inclined to act independently. So how important is it that the hip be out of joint? It's utterly important. Okay. Because otherwise you're going to lean on yourself. Okay. He had tried to plan for the work of God instead of waiting to follow out God's plan. But he could gain nothing by rushing on before the Lord. Jesus bids him, follow me. Do not run ahead of me. Mm -hmm. Then you will have the hosts of Satan to meet alone. Let me go before you and you will not be overcome by the enemy. Beautiful, eh? Beautiful. Those who preach the truth will meet Satan in many forms. It is the duty of the minister of Christ to stand faithful at his post in the fear of God. Thus he may put to confusion the hosts of Satan and triumph in the name of the Lord. So standing at your post, you overcome the devil. Doing your duty. Doing your duty. Yeah, being obedient. All right, here's a very interesting quote from Jesus' Name Above All Name, page 150. God will again move mightily upon chosen servants to make terrible charges upon the hosts of Satan. Is that attack mode, Martin? That is offen offense. That's offense, right? Very so good. You, do, yeah, you don't stand and wait for it to defend. You are going over to the offensive side. The people whom he will accept to carry forward his work to fight his battles must be people of principle, brave, firm, and true. Customs, traditions, and doctrines, even of the professedly great and good people, must have no weight until first brought to the infallible test of the law and the testimony. Here we go back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. To the law and to the testimony. As I already said, it, it. if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. Yes. So we cannot listen to what anybody says unless we've put it through the filter of the law and the testimony. Now, Martin, what if you've become confused on the law and you're thinking you're keeping the law when in actual fact you're keeping another law that mm -hmm. has been modified to look like God's law? You've and you might not even know had you not read the testimony. That's the problem. Uh, There's also a verse that says, my people are dying for a lack of knowledge. Correct. So if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. To this test, popes and prelates refuse to submit, knowing that it would overthrow at once all their pretended power. It was to maintain this great truth that Luther battled so firmly and fearlessly. His words echoed down the line to all the tried and tempted defenders of the truth. Stand fast in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. So this battle has been fought many, many times, but the final battle will be on a universal scale. Mm -hmm. And nobody is excluded because the kingdom of God has penetrated all kingdoms, put itself above them, and people are pressing in, right? Exactly. So you see, and still, it cannot be fought alone. This whole battle will be along with the host. That's why we have to remember the word. Ma'anoim. We're not alone. So the nature of the final battle. The Lord has opened his armory and has brought forth the weapons of his indignation. So who's doing the fighting? God is. God is. 
At his own will, God summons the forces of nature to overthrow the might of his enemies. Fire, hail, snow, vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Quoting Psalms 148 verse 8. When the heathen Amorites had set themselves to resist his purpose, God interposed, casting down great stones from heaven upon the enemies of Israel. We are told of a greater battle to take place in the closing scenes of earth's history. When Jehovah has opened his armory and has brought forth the weapons of his indignation, quoting Jeremiah, Hast thou inquired, entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of hail which I have reserved against the time of trouble in the day of battle and war? Job 38, verse 22 and 23. It's a battle and it's a war. And there will be physical war probably as well. Yes. The Revelator describes the destruction that is to take place when the great voice of the temple of heaven announces it is done. He says, there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. So this will be a mighty conflict. You see, so this was more the scenes in that time of trouble when the plagues are falling. Yes, this is the final battle. This is Armageddon. But before this, and that's the Lord fighting now. That's his host, actually. That's him fighting. But before that, you've got this spiritual battle as well that also he has to be part of. Yes, and the, and the weapons of our warfare, we have to look at that. Do we take the sword out? Mm -hmm. We'll have to be very circumspect when it comes to that. So in the last scenes of this earth's history, war will rage. That's a physical war That's that will be raging amongst the nations. We're not to be involved in that war. No. We have a different war. The powers of evil will not yield up the conflict without the struggle. But providence has part to act in the battle of Armageddon. The captain of the Lord's host will stand at the head of the angels of heaven to direct the battle. He, on whose vesture is written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords, leads forth the armies of heaven on white horses, clothed in fine linen, clean and white. This is a righteous battle. That's it. Like you showed us in the Armageddon WhatsApp prof that we did two years probably ago. This will be at the second coming. We are part of this battle. Mm. We are part of it spiritually. We are involved physically because there will be consequences to the choices that you make. And the final conflict will be short but terrible. We know these quotes, but let's read them again. We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Prophecies are fulfilling. The last great conflict will be short but terrible. I'm very glad that it will be short. Yes. But it's coming. It's just around the corner. Yeah. Old controversies will be revived. And new controversies will arise. We've seen some new ones. Are you going to be with a woke crowd or are you not yeah, going yeah. to be with it? We have a great work to do. Our ministerial work must not cease. Now we're getting to some practical advice. What must we do in the time that we are living in? The last warning must be given to the world. Okay. That's number one. Number one. We can't sit back and say, let's just preach the love of Jesus. You have to go in the offense. You have to go to the offense. And who will be in that offense? We've seen already, but we'll see some more. So the world must hear the message. There is a special power in the presentation of the truth at the present time. How long will it last? Only a little while. Short time. But every resource we have must go into this battle now. The inquiry of everyone should be, what am I? To whom do I owe allegiance? Is my heart renewed? That's Jacob's trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Is my soul reformed? Are my sins forgiven? Will they be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come? Jacob's trouble. Yes, We're I all going to have to go through it. That part is my soul reformed? That's a very important thing. Do I allow God to change my habits, 
my thought pattern, my lifestyle. My lifestyle. You know, we have been so indoctrinated with uh, the concepts of the world. I have come across so many people who, who believe once saved, always saved. And uh, are there no consequences to transgression? <clears throat> Prophets wrote for their own and our day. The last books of the Old Testament shows us workers taken from the laborers in the fields. Others were men of high ability and extensive learning, but the Lord gave them visions and messages. These men of the Old Testament spoke of things transpiring in their day, and Daniel, Isaiah, and Ezekiel not only spoke of things that concerned them as present truth, but their sights reached down to the future and to what should occur in these last days. Well, if you can just quickly bring that back to that uh, episode we did on last days, end of time, and all of those. It shows you, once again, they, Daniel and them actually foresaw in that whole era of Christianity and the remnant part yes. what all the troubles will be. And categorized so neatly for us, and, and still, we mix it all together like in a blender. So Christ stands by the side of persecuted saints. Never is the tempest-tried soul more dearly loved by his Savior than when he is suffering reproach for the truth's sake. When for the truth's sake the believer stands at the bar of unrighteous tribunals, Christ stands by his side. Manaim. Mm -hmm. All the reproaches that fall upon the human believer fall upon Christ in the person of his saints. I will love him, said Christ, and will manifest myself to him. Quoting John chapter 14. Christ is condemned over again in the person of his believing disciples. When for the truth's sake, the believer is incarcerated in prison walls, Christ manifests himself to him and ravishes his heart with his love. When he suffers death for the sake of Christ, Christ says to him, they may kill the body, but they cannot hurt the soul. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Martin, do we have that faith? We have to get it if we don't. And we she, have to have it. This is hard words. This is talking about physical, maybe torture, death, well, going yeah. through rough things. But if those things should happen, God will supply the strength to deal with it. He will give you the gift of martyrdom as he gave those martyrs. That but we have a it. promise that there will be many that will be translated. Otherwise, true. Elijah would not have been a representative of those that will overcome without seeing death. So I think if we put our focus towards this end, we must focus on the job being done and not, oh, what's going to happen to me. Correct. He says, they crucified me, and if they put you to death, they crucify me afresh in the person of my saints. Persecution cannot do more than cause death. But the life is preserved to eternal life and glory. The persecuting power may take its stand and command the disciples of Christ to deny the faith, to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils by making void the law of God. But the disciples may ask, why should I do this? I love Jesus. I will never deny his name. When the power says, I will call you a disturber of the peace, they may answer, thus they call Jesus, who was truth and grace and peace. Now we've got all of these things and we're heading for this time and we need to be fortified. But we have a promise too that God will not allow you to be challenged and tempted yeah. beyond what you can endure. So right? with every trial he gives an outcome as well. And that main thing is what you've, the whole discussion is going about. Maha Nahim. He is there with you. All right. Now, let's just have a look who's going to be involved. God's measurement of those who walk in the light they have. The Lord will give his message to those who have walked in accordance with the light 
that they have had. That's an important point. So modern, if you had only a little bit of light, God will give you his message. Mm -hmm. And you have to walk according to that light. And will recognize them as true and faithful according to the measurement of God. These men will take the place of those who, having light and knowledge, have walked not in the way of the Lord, but in the imagination of their unsanctified hearts. Martin, it's not good enough to say, I'm part of this church that has great light. If you don't live according to the light, God will rather choose someone who has a little bit of light but has lived up to it. That's it. Uh, it's scary. That's a big problem that we have. Because we all have imagination. Oh, but I'm okay. I'm doing this and this and this. But that part that God has shown me, uh, I'm putting it off. I'll work on that later. We are now living in the last days when the truth must be spoken. When in reproof and warnings it must be given to the world, irrespective of consequences. Martin, we cannot have a wishy-washy message. If there are some who will become offended and turn from the truth, we must bear in mind that there were those who did the same in Christ's day. So Martin, must we become discouraged when people turn from the truth? It is hard, but no, we must not get discouraged. No matter who that person is, no. if it be you, if it be me, it should not discourage you or me. We should just carry on. Carry on. And still, your heart goes out to the person. What did we learn in the beginning? That you have to still do it with the love, with that caring. All so right. if you have to put somebody off or out and say, okay, I'm not going to be affected by this, it doesn't mean that you write them off. Yes. Now, every day, somebody, well, not every day, but almost every day, somebody sends me something by someone who has become offended and turned his back on the truth and on the church mm -hmm. and says, well, what do you say about this? Almost like a challenge, yeah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> are you going to stick with this crowd or what are you going to do? I have to ask myself, where is the truth? The fact that there are people that don't live up to the truth doesn't make it any less the truth. That's it. Right? And so some of these people, they are offended and they say, you know, in the beginning it was fine, it was the truth, but now there are so many that are not living the truth, therefore I'm not going to do this. And many get offended with the, the testimonies, of course, yes. and leave the church because of that. Well, I have news for them. Their places will be taken by those who've had a little light and lived up to it. Yeah, and I just want to also say, on that note, you were talking about this, getting discouraged. Well, how many videos do we get from people that make videos against well, f f what the study that we do? That's fine. If they, if they come with the thus says the Lord and show us where we are wrong, that's fine. That's but if they're said. just ranting and raving, let them rant and rave. And that's what I said. So it's not necessary to always sit here and defend ourselves the whole time against those videos because yeah. the studying that's being done here should speak for itself. We mainly quote, don't we? So the ranks will not be diminished, Martin, no matter how many people apostatize, even if it be not one in 20 that remains. And that's a quote, by the way. Yeah. But there are men who will receive the truth, and these will take the places made vacant by those who become offended and leave the truth. The Lord will work so that the disaffected ones will be separated from the true and the loyal ones. The ranks will not be diminished. Those who are firm and true will close up the vacancies that are made by those who become offended and apostatize. You know what's interesting, Martin? They all tell you that you must separate and come up. Basically, they've separated themselves already. I've mentioned this many times before. If there's a shaking, and those that are shaken out, or the tears that will be blown away, or all of that, is outside of it. And you are going on, no, we have to get out. On which side are you standing? And there are so many winds of doctrine, but 
they're barking from outside now because they've separated themselves and think you must separate yourself too. And then they come with the whole, they try and put this together that, oh no, but the problem is that which you are still in is not the true. This is now the truth. This is now the truth. But uh, the Bible says there will be a spewing out, not, not a coming out, mm. except that of Babylon. That's it. Many will prize the wisdom of God above any earthly advantage and will obey the word of God as the supreme standard. These will be led to great light. These will come to the knowledge of the truth and will seek to get this light of truth before those of their acquaintance who, like themselves, are anxious for the truth. So there will only be two sides. You're either on the side of Christ or you are on the side of Satan. Only two armies. We are nearing the close of Earth's history when two parties alone can exist. And every man, woman and child will be in one of these armies. Now isn't this the reason why Satan has created so many apparent armies? Yeah. Exactly, to let you, and then you can choose any other one. Give you a smorgasbord. Mm -hmm. There are only two. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, they belong to the other army. You know, this is so interesting. So where's the gray area here? There's no gray area. Mm, I wonder, because there's a lot of people that love to say there's a gray area, and they love to live in that area. There were only two trees mm. when it came to a moral choice. And you either chose the one or the other. There and was no fence to sit on. And don't we get a lot of flack of people that say we see things only in black and white? And Absolutely, all the time. Well, if you see it that way, isn't it in harmony with there's only two ways and that's there's it? There's only two ways. You can't sit on a fence. Like Martin Luther said, you either stand behind Christ or you stand behind the devil or else you're going to get crushed. That's if you're it. sitting on the fence, you're going to get crushed. So Jesus will be the general of one army, of the opposing army, Satan will be the leader. All who are breaking and teaching others to break the law of God, the foundation of his government in heaven and in earth, are marshaled under one superior chief who directs them in opposition to the government of God. I wonder when you watch television and you watch the Grammys and you watch all of these, uh, is it rocket science to determine whose side they're on? It depends on what type of frontal lobe you're using. Because if you are brainwashed with it, you don't see it. I mean, it's so obvious that they are not part of it. And this is, this is the propaganda of the world. That's it. They've so, taken away logical thinking completely. So if you love the world, then you are in, in enmity with God, right? You're an enemy. All who are breaking and teaching others to break the law of God, the foundation of his government in heaven and in earth, are marshaled under one superior chief, who directs them in opposition to the government of God. Now, if you want to know about the government of God, you don't just read the Ten Commandments. Read it all. Mm -hmm. That's true. Go and read Leviticus and see where you stand in the stream of time compared to what's happening in the world out there. And you will know that the world is not living in harmony with God. They're living in harmony with the devil. Yeah. And they will show it in the Grammys by wearing devil's horns. That's it. They show it blatantly, but then people are defending the devil now. Yes. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, are rebels against the law of God and enemies to all who love and obey his commandments. These subjects, which Satan, their leader, will gather others into their ranks through every possible means to strengthen his forces and urge his claims. Through his deception and delusion, Satan would, if possible, deceive the very elect. His is no minor deception. He will seek to annoy, to harass, to falsify, to accuse, to misrepresent all whom he cannot compel to give him honor and help him in his work. His great success lies in keeping men's minds confused and ignorant of his devices, for then he can lead the unwary, as it were, blindfolded. Martin, 
These are such excellent statements. And then people say this is false prophecy. Yeah, and why do you want to continue reading all of these things? Now, let me just ask. After reading a quote like that, can you see how people want to justify things? Always. And that's what's bothering me these days. We always want to justify some reason why I don't have to work on this, or I, it's not yet necessary, or you God knows my heart. You try to move to a gray area. That's it. Isaiah 52. Now therefore, what have I here, says the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them make them to howl, says the Lord, and my name continually every day is blaspheme. Do we see that in the world? No. Oh, yes. Therefore my people shall know my name. They shall know his character. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. That day, that's the final reckoning. Second How coming. beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that says unto Zion, thy God reigneth. In other words, evangelism is beautiful in the sight of God. <laughs> thy watchmen shall lift up thy voice. With the voice together they shall sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. But we're at the point when the Lord is going to bring against Zion and the chaff will be separated from the wheat and we have to stand together with like-minded people. This nonsense that everybody is an island and speaks here from one little angle has to stop. God's people have to start speaking with one voice. One ministry and another ministry with the same purpose must stand together we must preach the three angels' message in unison. That's it. Stop throwing stones at each other. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. This is a universal issue. He continues, Depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch not no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rare wedding. Mahanaim. You're not going to do this alone. But there's a condition. Yes. Don't mingle with the profane. Don't. Stay on your side and be oh, that no unclean thing. Martin, Stay pure. I'm going to ask it again. Is the ecumenical movement going to be your friend? It cannot. It's unclean. It's going to be your enemy. What are we doing there? Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before his people. That Maha Nahim, he will be there, finished. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went before their face and stood behind them. We are not alone in this battle. As the decree issued by the various rulers of Christendom against commandment keepers. Let's just stop right there. It's such an important sentence. Didn't we just say that? Is the ecumenical movement going to help you? No. So just read that again. It's Christendom. As the decree issued by the various rulers of Christendom. So the decree is coming from where? From Christendom. Yeah. And the other nations will follow. She leads out, but the other nations will follow. Doesn't this bring to mind the pendulum that we've been talking about the whole time? Have they practiced that over the last decades? Mm -hmm. Ostracizing groups, demonizing groups, and then saying those are the evil ones and the whole world has to fight them or else. That's it. And everybody runs toward that part. As the decree issued by the various rulers of Christendom against commandment keepers shall withdraw the protection of government, 
and abandon them to those who desire their destruction, the people of God will flee from the cities and villages and associate together in companies, dwelling in the most desolate and solitary places. Many will find refuge in the strongholds of the mountains, like the Christians of the Piedmont Valley. They will make the high places of the earth their sanctuaries and will thank God for the munition of rocks. But many of all nations and all classes, high and low, rich and poor, black and white, will be cast into the most unjust and cruel bondage. If you can't get out, get out now. Get out. The beloved of God pass weary days bound in chains, shut in by prison bars, sentenced to be slain. Some apparently left to die of starvation in dark and loathsome dungeons. No human ear is open to hear their moans. No human hand is ready to lend them help. But they've got a promise. They have a promise. Maha Naim. And God even if it is dark, God will give them light. God, God will take care of them. Medical missionary work must leave room for the ministry of the word. Contempt is never to be expressed in regard to the promulgation of God's word. The third angel's message must not be smothered to death. We have to do many things. We have to do medical missionary work. Not disjointed it from... It must be linked to the word of God. Why are so many institutes trying to please the world by separating the word from the health message? You cannot do it. No. It will not have the blessing of God. And especially our institutions that has to do with health. This is a, a nightmare. We, we have to get back to the biblical plan. We have to get back to that old-time religion. So, Martin, we are heading for a time of Jacob's trouble. We are heading for a showdown with the enemy. There will be a time of trouble such as never was. We have to bring the message of warning. We have to plead with people. We have to use every means at our disposal. The medical missionary work is going to be part and parcel of the end time work. And then the saints left the cities and villages associated together in companies living in the most solitary places. Angels provided them food and water while the wicked were suffering from hunger and thirst. The writing's on the wall. That's it. This is where it's heading. And this is actually now past the where you have been looking after yourself. The leading men of the earth consulted together with Satan and his angels busy around them. Copies of a writing were scattered in different parts of the land, giving orders that unless the saints would yield their distinct faith, give up the Sabbath and observe the first day of the week, the people were free after a certain time to kill them. That sounds unimaginable. But Martin... We are living in a time where we are almost in the Wild West, where people pick up their guns, shoot people mm -hmm. in grocery stores, carry on like they want. And if an enemy is once defined, oh. the wrath of the people is stirred up against them. If I can mention, uh, if we think about the past three years, and then weren't there in those three years, whenever there was... Uh, let's say a decree that went out and there were certain people that didn't want to adhere to that. Weren't they ostracized? No, they were even demonized. Yeah. And then they were even called murderers of people, of their friends, if they didn't do adhere to some things. It, so, it, it was horrendous what happened. It was absolutely horrendous. So we can expect the same thing. We have to face this. But in this trying time, the saints were calm and composed, trusting in God, leaning on his promise that a way of escape would be made for them. The only safe path is to the law and to the testimony. And coercion has never been part of God's plan. Again, at a later date, referring to the league contemplated by the Reformed princes, he declared that the only weapons employed in this warfare should be the sword of the spirit. This refers to the speech made by the elector of Saxony 
in the time of Martin Luther. He was his protector. And he said, we cannot in our conscience approve of the proposed alliance. Our Lord Christ is mighty enough and can well find ways and means to rescue us from danger and bring the thoughts of the ungodly princes to nothing. They were facing a war in Europe. Mm. And they were trying to make alliances to see how they were going to fight this battle. It's almost like uh, David numbering the people. And the elector was given so much wisdom by God. And he said, the sword of the Spirit is our weapon. Christ is only trying us whether we are willing to obey his word or no, and whether we hold it for certain truth or not. We would rather die ten times over than that the gospel should be a cause of blood or hurt by any act of ours. Let us rather patiently suffer, and as the psalmist says, he accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And instead of avenging or defending ourselves, leave room for God's wrath. The cross of Christ must be borne. Let your highness be without fear. We shall do more by our prayers than all our enemies by their boastings. Only let not your hands be stained with the blood of your brethren. If the emperor requires us to be given up to his tribunals, we are ready to appear. You cannot defend the faith. Each one should believe at his own risk and peril. Written in the Great Controversy, we're facing that same period. We will also have to say, here we stand, we can do no other. Exactly. That we will all be faced with it. So let's bring this to a conclusion. Here's another quote. Let men leave room for the working of the Lord. Let the Lord have an opportunity to take care of his sacred work, to fashion and to mold it according to his will. The ark was trusted to the kine, and the Lord directed these kine in such a way that they left their calves behind them, devoting themselves wholly to the work of the Lord, directed them to perform. They delivered the ark to the place where it belonged. But when God's people, who should have known better, tried to direct the path, there was a calamity, and a lot of introspection took place. So let us remember, we are in a war. We have a message to bring. The battle is not ours. Mm -mm. We have to take the message to the world. We cannot not bring the message. We have to apply what we know. We have to live what we know. And then when we have done all of that, we can conclude with Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Martin, I think that concludes the matter. We are not going towards any of this alone. Mahanaim. Two troops. Let's Amen. pray. Heavenly Father, we are living in such perilous times. And a little bit of contemplation about what awaits us and what our attitude and our thinking should be, surely it will be in place for a time such as this. Help us to reflect, help us to correct, and help us to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.